Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the manager of public programs at the Jewish Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation featuring Mason Klein and Leslie Gill, presented in conjunction with the exhibition Modern Look, Photography and the American Magazine, on view at the Jewish Museum through July 11th. We encourage you to visit if you are able to do so. The Saul and Harriet M. Rothkopf Media Program has been funded by a generous donation endowment from the Saul and Harriet M. Rothkopf Family Foundation. And we are so grateful for their continued support of the museum's programming. Now I would like to briefly introduce our speakers. Mason Klein is a critic, art historian, and senior curator at the Jewish Museum, where he has organized numerous exhibitions, including Modigliani, Beyond the Myth, Alias Man Ray, The Radical Camera, New York's Photo League 1936 to 1951, and more recently, Helena Rubinstein, Beauty is Power, and Modern Look, Photography, and the American Magazine. His work has received a number of honors, including recognition from the National Jewish Book Award, International Association of Art Critics, the New England Book Festival, the San Francisco Book Festival, and the Daedalus Foundation. He has written and published on a wide variety of American and European artists. Leslie Gill heads a New York City-based design and architecture firm that creates spaces for schools, residences, offices, and institutions, and has gained a reputation for executing innovative design. Her work has been featured in numerous architectural publications, including Interior Design, Architectural Review, Architectural Record, El Decor and the New York Times. Ms. Gill has twice been named a fellow of the New York Foundation for the Arts and has received a variety of grants and prizes for her work, including a citation of outstanding contribution in the field of architecture from the Cooper Union. She has taught throughout her career, including as an adjunct professor at Columbia University and Parsons School of Design, and as a visiting critic at Harvard University Graduate School of Design and Yale University. She was the vice chair of the Van Allen Institute Projects in Public Architecture and is currently serving as a board member for the Architectural League of New York. It is my pleasure to welcome Mason Klein and Leslie Gill to present this conversation. You see an, uh, an image on the screen now of, of uh, sort of inspiration for the design, um, a sort of mid-century uh, epitome of uh, graphic design for a show that was initially um, proposed by, by me uh, as an ex exhibition of photography and how it could be related in a novel way to graphic design. So it, it, it begins by uh, considering um, the emergence of photography and its multiple kinds of identity. When photography no longer was seen uh, in, a, in, a, in a singular way uh, as the ideal medium for representation, but as it changed really at the Bauhaus in the 20s and culminated um, as um, the modern, shall we say, at the Stuttgart 1929 exhibition of film and photo. So I wanted to deal with this sort of parameter of time from 1929, shall we say the early 30s to the 50s and approach photography and the concept of the emigre effect from a, a, a shall we say, revisionist approach um, to understand uh, how the emigres who came here forced to uh, flee the Bauhaus and other spaces of avant-garde activity and came to the United States and found a country that was emerging from the depression and uh, was absolutely uh, full of opportunity for them to engage in the ma many faceted, faceted ways that uh, artists, particularly these eclectic and multiply talented artists who painted and did illustration 
and photography um, could have uh, in an influence of profound proportions in America. So we wanted to, uh, I proposed this idea of mass media and photography to, to my dear colleague, Leslie Gill, and, and here we began with um, the designs that Alvin Lustig, uh, the graphic designer, had made for an exhibition uh, in the 50s uh, that took place at the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts. And um, when I met Mason, I heard much of the same content that you heard today. And I listened to uh, both his desire to make this a revisionist vision, but also we looked at it as architects and designers, both towards the history of this incredible time where there was such innovation and experimentation, but equally trying to understand how we could take that point of view and make it contemporary for a different audience. And in doing so, um, I came to the table as uh, Mason well knows, understanding this period through the eyes of my mother and father who were both photographers and worked with two of the key figures of Mason's show, the art directors, Alexei Brodovich, who was at Harper's Bazaar, and Alexander Lieberman, who was at Vogue and Glamour and Condé Nast. So the first thing that I did was sort of look at influences and try to understand how everyone overlapped, not from hearsay, but trying to go back into history and trying to listen to what Mason was researching and telling me. So this was quickly sort of gave us a framework, but also uh, really was thrown away in response to some of the other things that we began to do. So one was to look at organization of the various pieces that Mason wanted to put into the show through the idea of these mentors and art directors that spawned this incredible experimentation in America. Both so of whom at, were, you know, mm -hmm. may I chime in? Both of whom were immigrants and both of whom had enormous experience with modernism in Europe. And they came to America um, in the late thirties and uh, well, Lieberman a little later, um, I think he arrived around 40, um, with this notion that the artist, the modern artist was one who could do anything. And this was very different from the American standard practice. There was, there was Edward Steichen who was in the show, both of these men um, and worked and came from the same mentality and sensibility that is European in that they did not differentiate between applied art, that is art made with the purpose of working with others to either sell a product or promote or advertise um, something, but uh, was different from the American parochial view that that uh, fine art and commercial art should distingu be distinguished and remain apart. So we started to collect and relate photographs and multimedia, as you see here, and perhaps uh, understand how they could be interrelated in a spatial context as well as a conceptual one. So what you're looking at here is a diagram of the plan of the space, of the exhibit space, and sort of relative to the area that this type of organization would begin to require to begin to group the photographs in this way. But at the same time as we're exploring one idea, Mason and I were also looking at other potential ways to think about the show and having had parents who were the photographers and creators of much of this work, I was looking at what individual vision or experiments were and looking at typography and graphic design as being one idea that the narrative structure of books being another, 
uh, street photography or cinematography as being other interests of my parents and their peers. And I think that we struggled in some regard, particularly when it came to the influence of cinematography, but this led to a completely different way of seeing the same images and where they were dispersed and where they overlapped. And I think ultimately then Mason went back with these sort of new ideas and came up with a structure, which is what we landed on and is shown here in these exhibit sections. So from going from the particular to the more general generalized concept, uh, we um, had this precursor section in the beginning, film and photo, which was that exhibition that uh, for the, was very famous for presenting um, not only where photography was was or had had what, what photographers had achieved by the end of the twenties, but they questioned where it was headed, and of course, involved was in that was advertising and the whole absorption of design. So if, if we can go back one step sure. uh, to right. the, the schematic, uh, rather than just look at some kind of cinematographic or, uh, you know, uh, design, it was a, a, about broadening these areas and understanding them in some more conceptual way. So art is design, design is art, was clearly about applied art, about looking at art in a broader sense that it had been considered. Fashion, of course, was about aspiring to another image of oneself, and particularly coming out of the depression. Uh, contested page, which became the core of the uh, section of the exhibition, was how photographers and graphic designers began to contest the limitations or editorial restrictions that editors managed to levy uh, as subtly as possible. Reimagining industry was how magazines and various house organs of pharmaceutical companies and artists began to be, their innovation, their value was such that uh, in terms of projecting an image of the future or projecting some compelling visual language, uh, many of these, let's, let's say proprietors or uh, executives realized that their image could be formulated and their brand could be uh, very well or more easily acknowledged if they hired talented artists to promote them. The graphic effect was the last uh, category because we all, the whole purpose of the show to me, or in terms of revisionism, was to acknowledge a certain lacuna, a certain omission in uh, the history of photography. Photography's dominance in multimedia has been so great or was so great throughout the 20th century that it was very easy to underestimate what powerful, uh, 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 let's say, compositional and influential uh, effect uh, designers, graphic design had on photography. Um, and we'll explain that as we go along. So we're going to just show you very briefly the kinds of photographs that were in each of these sections. Um, and Mason, I don't know whether you want to sort of jump I'll in. I'll just say a few it. things. I mean, at the Bauhaus, the word, the textual typography became with the protractor or everything else with a pencil <coughs> and the photograph. Uh, uh, they became combined in a way that was really about true equity. And um, each could have an influence in a different way, depending on the, con and the context. And um, so I, I wanted to show people who um, were broadening avant-garde photography, which was Georgi Kepisch, uh, 
At the same time, they were adding gouache, which you really can't see here on the top right, but they were adding to that. So they were uh, alluding to historical practice, whether it's the silhouette or the, the, the precursor of the photographic portrait, or how, how American artists were trying to get out of the uh, impressionistic, moody, atmospheric effect and understand that a more minimalist approach uh, and one that engaged the world, like Edward Steichen, who was um, practically, um, well, the best noted uh, free-for-all photographer who began to design beautiful photographs that could, for the Steli Silk Company. And this is called Matches and Matchbox. And you can see the Lucky Strike box. It was all about using language and graphic effect uh, in novel ways, which is the continuation in the twin in the late well late twenties early thirties, uh, an unsung hero of uh, the graphic arts industry was a man a doctor named Robert Leslie, <clears throat> and he um, his uh, he was born here. His father was an immigrant, an immigrant who uh, had had converted to Judaism and he grew up on the Lower East Side and loved books, loved images, loved printing. And even though <clears throat> he became an obstetrician, pediatrician, he, his love of art and printing sort of gradually drew him away from medicine. And we just could see how here um, he in, engenders um, this exhibition space uh, that grew out of his compositional um, studio of printing uh, using Lester Beale, who was one of the up and coming graphic designers and a uh, European emigre, Herbert Beyer, um, both of whom were going to be um, involved with a, a, a vast amount of kinds of artistic production. And one of the great figures at the time who ruled um, the sort of world of, of magazine art direction was Alexei Bronovich. I sh we show these uh, stills from um, ballets that he photographed actually in the mid thirties. And, um, and through his teaching, uh, which began as a design lab in Philadelphia in 1933, he, he taught with equal concentration on both graphic design and photography for 25 years. And one of his students was uh, David Atty on the bottom right. But these were the figures who were steeped in uh, like Brodovich and Lieberman, European modernism, and they both were photographically literate. Um, and uh, so we see how this fusion of art and design, fashion and art became <coughs> in a qu quite early, at a quite early point, actually Lester Beale did this shot on the right, the cover of What's New, which was the organ for Abbott Laboratories um, and actually 1939 to 41, but it's, the text boxes, uh, the extraordinary use of, of that many, many years before they would be recycled, let us say, in postmodernist work by Barbara Kruger. And we see a whole series or lineage of design occurring on the page in ways that um, just really startled uh, the viewer. And that's what Brodovich wanted his students to do. He always used the Diaghilev, famous Diaghilev phrase, Etoni moi, astonish me. And that's what, that's what this Lester Beale cover truly does. The ways in which the artist challenged um, what was typically fashion photography was uh, um, manifold. It happened in so many different ways. And Lillian Bassman, dematerializing fashion, showed how graphic design, 
was being privileged over, as the editor of Harper's would always say, the bows and buttons of, um, of fashion. And in this, in one of the tear sheets in the show, we say, there's a quote by Bradovich, uh, this is very dangerous. I mean, I think that the thing that um, Mason was also trying to say was that these magazines were doing many functions. One was to convey a society that was developing and changing rapidly. And on the other hand, it was a commentary on society. And so I think the challenge was for Mason to find a narrative structure that would allow the conventional reading of this work at the same time that there was a new reading of the work. And to me, this section was one of the most challenging to do. Um, and one of the things that I think was interesting was to learn how many of these people were also art directors so that they were doing both they're developing their own photography and their own voice at the same time that they were working on mass production magazines. And so there's an interesting dialogue between their convention and their experimentation. Yeah. And parenthetically with Lillian Bassman, she was one of the first to do both. And, um, and then in the contested page, which was, which became the core section of the exhibition, this idea of how, how photography and mass media became less simply about presenting or producing beautiful, glamorous, pretty pictures, but more, more important was an opportunity to challenge the status quo, to uh, push the boundaries of what um, was appropriate, what was taboo, um, and um, to really engage a uh, changing post-war uh, sensibility of progress. And I say that in the most socially progressive way. Um, so magazines, besides the ebony uh, above, um, uh, would publish Gordon Park's work um, uh, for, in other magazines like Life, and Look, and um, and then of course there was this very strong proto-feminist sensibility that was emerging in these other offshoots uh, of Condé Nast, charm, glamour, and uh, just Lisette Modell's work alone with this Coney Island uh, is just had this extraordinary bullions. And she never thought, Lisette, that Carmel Snow and Harper's, you know, Hearst um, would publish it, but they did. And it was- I mean, I there. think what, what, there was sort of a running joke. I never understood contested page. And I kept saying, Mason, I don't understand this section. And he would explain it to me and I would not understand it. And finally, there was this moment where he turned to me and said, no, oh, it's the immigrants. It's the social uh, mandate of the Bauhaus, of, of these people who came from Europe. And I thought, oh my God, this is my mother. You know, this is what happened in the sense that there was this blind spot in my own uh, life experience of my family. And that- That ideal- that, that, Was, in, mm. you know, in, enabled to use this mass media platform to advocate for social changes that were happening in American society, particularly leading up to and then immediately after the war. And that to me is just such a revelatory way of looking at this work and mm -hmm. understanding that they used the page, they used the publications, but it gave them a freedom and a voice which became so important like in Gordon Parks's work. Yeah. It was an idealism that to be fair was, um, absolutely one that was embraced by so many people uh, coming out of the depression and understanding the potential of mass media to have an incredible effect on a readership. But it was that 
that belief that art and industry could work together uh, towards similar ends was one that would produce as much disillusionment uh, when corporations began to tighten and change and not encourage the same quality work uh, later on in the 50s. But again, like Fortune Magazine, Henry Luce really understood that using uh, the, this absolutely inventive uh, panoply of media, like the photograph and graphic design and geometry with illustration on the bottom was about, um, uh, it was really uh, a challenging uh, cover every week that they would, it would, this magazine would produce. And uh, I think it was a dollar an issue, Leslie, something like that. There was a lot of money back then. But even in these house circuit uh, organs like Scope, uh, you see the avant-garde uh, adoption um, of these uh, avenues of display like working for a pharmaceutical company, which is really quite amazing when you think about it, but how, how prescient some of these uh, executives were like Walter Paikey of uh, Container Corp who commissioned artists for decades. Mm -hmm. But then there was th those um, artists like Leiter, Saul Leiter and Herbert Matter who engaged, was hired by Noel and there was this wonderful, uh, uh, inexhaustible kind of uh, synergy between these artists and what they could do. Uh, and which brings us to Leslie's formidable genetic inheritance um, <laughs> of our parents' extraordinary creativity. But again, in terms of graphic effect, in terms of Brodovich, um, and Lieberman's um, understanding of uh, pushing the potential uh, I, visual ideas or a whole new um, type of visual communication uh, really came through um, by the end of the 40s. You see, as you see within the textual uh, or and visual um, parlance, let's say, a part of the pun of of photojournalism, as the as photojournalism became more and more nuanced, the photograph became so highly recognized as a potent image that language began to uh, fade to some extent. Um, and the image began to sort of supersede the word, the, the written word in magazines to a certain extent. Certainly life and look, people used to wait and, and with a voyeuristic kind of passion, turn those pages. So I'm just gonna, we've talked sort of about the structure of the, the organization of the exhibit, the, clear kind of curatorial narrative at this point is coming to light as well as the um, images that are going to be included. And at this moment, as an architect and designer, we begin to think about how that is going to be manifested. And I went back to Alvin Lustig here and looked at this class, new classic series that he developed. And to me, it had, the, he was the Renaissance man between architecture, exhibit design and graphics that he, everything he did had a sense of space. And in this case, it also was about the magazine and the page, the graphic page, and the page becomes dynamic. It comes off of the surface and bends across the cover of the X and Y axis on this image. And that is what we started with. So you saw this diagram before, and this began to be the amount of space we needed as well as the sequence as you come in, turn to the left, move around and come out to the right. 
So very quickly, we had to think about uh, exhibition design in very novel ways. It was COVID. It had to be built simply with as few people as possible, keep large open spaces, allow for safety within the exhibit space. And so we worked with this kind of central uh, spine of construction that you then circulate around where the folded page dynamically comes off of the wall and onto the floor, beginning to talk about a kind of play once again between the flattened page of the magazine and the dynamic space that you understand these photographs to exist within. So just quickly, these are three images that show you how we began to develop and think about uh, photographs, but also what we kind of commonly refer to as the jungle gym. This was another assistant curator who worked with Mason. Uh, one of her children looked at this and said, it looks like a jungle gym. And so they've been named the jungle gyms ever since. And to Mason and I, this was a moment to begin to bring in the understanding that in a modern context, we look at the photograph as being privileged and being different and more high art as opposed to the facsimile. But at the time that these pieces were produced, there was really no difference at all. There was a kind of fluidness of that boundary. And so we really wanted to emphasize that in these freestanding pieces that are in the exhibit. You know, I yep. just want to uh, jump in be, because, um, we, you know, as a curator, we always think of, um, we think of telling the story and how that narrative uh, progresses and can change, but can hold and be coherent in each gallery. And what L Leslie uh, did brilliantly was to uh, reiterate uh, spatially that that this you know that layouts and pages were always like on the floor because growing up you, I mean you just saw how in the 40s and 50s how a magazine was constructed and often someone like Brodovich would lay out everything on the floor. I just love the idea of Alvin Lustig's initial uh, portable exhibition. Um, uh, structures uh, became sort of metaphoric uh, pages that were floating in space and were interchangeable or spatial. And the way that the paint sections would indicate um, uh, a kind of overlap of, or even breadth of, you know, in the gutter of a magazine, it was a it was a, a radical uh, design that breached the um, the gutter and bled onto another page and and that's what Leslie did so brilliantly here. So I'm going to go back just quickly to these two people uh, that we've talked about. On the left is a photograph of my mother of Alexander Lieberman. And on the right is a picture of Brodovich with um, Richard Avedon working on Avedon's book, Observations, that was highlighted in one of the sections of Mason's uh, exhibit. I mean, those two figures, what was interesting and what I could sort of help Mason with is that my father worked with Brodovich for about 20 years and my mother worked with Lieberman. And um, what I was able to give him some clues of how they, thought about their work or how they worked with photographers. And um, it, in Lieberman's case, he was much more interested. I think, you know, we've talked about uh, sort of the social, the idea that the magazine uh, understood um, the United States social organization and somehow put it out there in the world, whether it was about fame, whether it was about, um, the opportunities, uh, naivete, but somehow his interest was much more about creating a mood and that dovetailed very much with my mother, whereas Brodovich was fundamentally someone who was a designer and 
kind of gathered around him, I think, people who had no boundaries. They could do typography. Some of them did writing, they did lettering, they did drawing, they were painters, they were photographers. And it sense uh, somehow, essentially they were all tinkerers as well, but they were inventive in terms of technology of the time. So to me, those were the differences between those two people from the point of view of listening to move my family stories and the history of my mother and father. Hmm. Yeah, Branovich really did uh, not only encourage people to flout rules, but experiment to the point where if they made a mistake, they could they might likely produce, like in David Addy's case, overexposing his film right. was very much in keeping with Branovich's bleaching of negatives and et cetera. And Brodovich also would have you um, take photographs and the assistant was developing and running the photographs over throughout the day. So your studio had to be in close proximity and he would just mark up the images and send them back again. So he saw the photograph as a kind of um, design element that was malleable just at the same time as the photographers he worked with because many of them were designers or trained as designers mm -hmm. saw the photograph in service to the the magazine and Mason's alluded that developed over time and we're going to talk about that in a moment in terms of my father's work but I think um, these were really collaborative conversations that happened uh, with Lieberman I think he was less interested in the page and less interested in the magazine as the sort of artifact he was much more involved in, as I said, the sort of social component of who we were as a nation and what we were developing into, whether it was the advancement of women during the war in the beginning of the war, or whether it was the conformist era uh, post-war and the development of stardom and fame. Um, all of those things were things that he was compelled by. Lieberman was, uh, yeah, he was, he was a, he never really got over the fact that the art world wouldn't thoroughly embrace him. So in some kind of reactive way, he had to sort of say, well, the magazine served a purpose, but it wasn't, you know, high art. But I think that what he did was introduce high art to the masses. And, and I think that that was one of his more important contributions was to make Vogue into a kind of cultural, um, you know, a, an access uh, point for people to, to learn and to experience mm -hmm. a lot of art that they wouldn't otherwise come into contact with. But I think the common component of the two of them was that mm -hmm. they were just extraordinary mentors. They kept people right. moving and on their toes and experimenting and pushing mm -hmm. them uh, in my mother's case, she, he pushed my mother out of the studio. He said, you're not a studio photographer. Get out of the building. Go out on the street. And that was where Did she ever life. <laughs> so um, should we jump back in? Should we go back in and look at some of yeah. the work? So so, you have your father's first? Yeah. Um, this is just the early work, which is... Um, my father and Diane of Vreeland were the two people who sponsored Brodovich to come into the United States. And my father is about, uh, he's the same age as, as Munkashi, who's also in the exhibit, but he's born, I think it's in 1909, but I'm not positive about that. Um, but he's of an age where he just comes into his own after the depression. He as a young family, he needs to have a job and he starts as a art director of House Beautiful. He meets Brodovich, obviously, when he first comes to America, they have a synergy. And on the left, you can see that um, this is a drawing of both Brodovich's and my father's. Both of them are drawing and doing a maquette for a photograph that will become the cover of Harper's Bazaar. And I just wanted to show this because this is how they thought, you know, they were um, 
versatile and they were they understood how to draft, how to illustrate, how to draw, how to letter. They understood typography. So they tried to think through what the photograph will be. And these two early examples that are from sort of mid uh, 30s show that the photograph is actually illustrative. Uh, the images here have a kind of playful relationship to type. Like you'll see, for example, that the pearls cut away holes at the type and knock out the type or the, um, uh, the kind of relationship of the rag in the upper right hand image show that they are thinking about what the typography is going to be before the photograph is actually taken. It was just at that point, Leslie, that, that illustration was yielding to photography as a component. So we have, it's, it's a beautiful moment of transition to have these blocks, uh, you know, sharing the page in such a wonderfully um, instructive way, or in the pearls in text as well. But my father, for example, buys his first camera and take the first photographs just a year and a half before these images are taken. So that fundamentally it's a new medium for him that he's beginning to explore along with many of his peers. And I think this page, Nathan and I both fail, show the kind of very rapid shift you know, over five years of how photography is in on the left-hand side in service to the illustrative idea to becoming an actual commentary in and of itself. And then finally querying and being part of the relationship between type, image, drawing, collage, and some way now an active player in the development of magazines. Would yeah. you agree with that, Mason? Oh, absolutely. I think that, um... And all three images to varying degrees, photography um, is, is uh, animated um, or animates uh, the graphic elements to, you know, each cover here uh, exhibits it differently. But certainly in Paul Rand's case and direction, it was so um, uh, such a famous image because here it is. He's, he's replacing gift wrapping uh, ribbon with barbed wire in 1940 saying Merry Christmas and, and alluding to the horrors that were going on in Germany with this, these sprinkles, these red dots uh, that uh, ominously um, refer to the bloodshed. But you know the way he photographed uh, the barbed wire uh, so carefully to project that incredible shadow really shows how uh, there, this beautiful inter incorporation of photography and graphic design uh, at this point in time. And the image on the right um, really talks about the idea of collaboration. So this, this cover is done in tandem by Alexei Brodovich, Leslie Gill. And it's one of the first images that Irving Penn does after he leaves Brodovich's uh, lab in uh, Pennsylvania where he has been a student. And so this is the kind of turning point where um, there's the importance isn't necessarily on individuality right now, it's about the collective endeavor that it takes to produce a magazine on a bi-weekly or monthly basis or weekly basis. Yeah, but another manifestation of the ideal of collaboration, the collective, um, which is pretty much lost today. I mean, mm -hmm. people don't share the same ideals and, and, and uh, do not work together in the same way that had to, had to prevail then. And these next couple of images are uh, just show the development of my father's work, I think, and it still is very related to the page. Um, these are all done with Brodovich uh, at Harper's. 
but you can see that the photograph still is anticipating the type, but sometimes it actually has dominance over it. And that there's now an increasing um, reliance on the photograph holding its own on the page. It's if there's, it's taking over the real estate, it's becoming the object just as much as the type was in earlier and the narrative of the type was in earlier projects. So this is from uh, 1935. So this is um, about six months after he gets a camera for the first time. Yeah, it's, he was self-taught. He was, it was really incredibly quick. Um, uh, point, but he really did care about showing all the elements uh, and the artifice of of the image um, being constructed on the page. And then finally, I think here in this uh, last uh, series from Harper's per se, um, it's about the photograph now done after the war, after the experience of being a leader during a really terrible series of years and coming back and needing the calm and middle, minimalism, I can't say that word, um, and also understanding that it's a new time, that there's no need for as much extravagance. It's now about a kind of modernism that comes to play, but the here, the photograph to me holds its own. He's thinking about the photograph as a thing that exists uncropped, uh, probably longer than the duration of the magazine itself. So the first time I feel like there's a longevity in his work as he begins to distill the world and the noise of the world into these series of images. But, but he still has that palette knife. He still has, he still has the tools of the artist in the studio. <laughs> I still have the palette knife. <laughs> I do have this one. Um, and, uh, but again, the relationship of now the private work on the right hand side, it's a calling card that he uses as his calling card um, and business card, uh, refers back to some of the early work and the spaces that he did with Lillian Bassman at uh, Junior Bazaar just years before. So there's a kind of interrelationship now between private work and public work. And Mason, I just threw these in, but each one of his pictures here show that he's still querying the page, but the page now changes. Sometimes it's engaged as a frame in the side of the work. Sometimes there's a tongue in cheek about how type is used, but then in the Nadelman, it's the sheet that's put up and the figure spill out into the landscape around that page and become dynamic. You know, a, a foil that Irving Penn would use for years and years. But I think that there, there's such a dialogue between Irving Penn and your father. And your father is, um, was, was a real influence uh, in still life. And, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, my father would go down with Brodovich to critique the students' work. So there was an, you know, a generation of people that emerged of Penn's generation, who's about 10 years uh, younger than my father, mm -hmm. that were heavily influenced by the kind of work and advancements he was doing. He was also, um, he came from a family of engineers. So he invented a lot of the equipment. Um, he used strobe for some of the first time for the use of still life. And so he was constantly inventing tripods and working with color film and advance it and in collaboration with Kodak to advance color film to different purposes. Mm -hmm. Mason, I'll let you talk about the, the uh, portraits here, particularly the one on the left which you feel still refers to the well I just feel it's 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 always about the contained uh, window into the world but a, 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 a kind of artificial construction and to show um, in both of these portraits um, art 
in the background. It's all and placing Savinio, who is Alberto uh, de Chirico uh, and de Chirico's brother, uh, and this um, master painting in the back and the woman looking out, it's always about acknowledging to some extent uh, with Leslie uh, Gill's work that, that there is this construction, this artifice. It's, it's not about a simple um, elision of, of that craft or studio aspect. Leslie always wanted to have that dialogue be present uh, in the work. There was a, the art, artistry of it. I think the, I mean, in terms of advertising imagery and having um, women um, be the protagonists in carrying across a subtle message, uh, Ringel and Pitt, who came out of the Bauhaus, uh, having studied with Walter Peterhans, they, there wasn't a real photography studio class given at the Bauhaus until 29, right before it a few years before it was uh, closed down, but Ringel and Pitt played with the nuances of femininity and played with it in a very wry way uh, in, in this picture in Comal hair coloring that starts the show. But uh, I would look, I mean, I, this, this particular McLaughlin from 46 shows uh, um, how quickly fashion became less mythologized, less about glamour, and more about uh, something that a woman could identify uh, for herself um, and uh, be much more appropriately real in the world. And just to photograph this sort of hooded outfit, it's, it's such a contemporary kind of uh, style and to place uh, a woman in front of a graffitied um, uh, urban environment was also rather novel at the time. Um, and yet there was a, a view of women as, as that last image of Gloria Vanderbilt indicated uh, as, re as reflective. Uh, women as not just as beautiful objects, but women who were going to um, take on the world in a different way. As we see in the next slide, um, women all of a sudden begin to be seen um, as uh, in the world in a very realistic way, almost in a, like as a cinematic still. And um, Leslie, you mentioned once that your mother was sort of um, identified with the Rashomon technique mm -hmm. of of really investing in the image a, a number of multiple nar potential narratives. And I just, what I love to see is that um, fashion becomes, is, is never loses its front and center importance, but it's more about personality. It's more about uh, uh, an individual in the world trying to figure out how to negotiate reality in the post-world era. Uh, and to not be afraid to show indecisiveness uh, or equivocation or uh, fallibility and fragility. Yeah, I mean, I think the war provided this opportunity for women. And so um, my mother had studied with Reginald Marsh and Kuniyoshi and was um, handed a camera, honestly, uh, as by her aunt and started to take photography classes with her twin sister who also was a photographer and became a photographer. And um, <clears throat> it was a medium that was not as valued at that point. She went to Pratt Institute and she just took off. And I think one of the things that I feel these early images that are on the right hand side bring in some of the teaching from Kuniyoshi and Marsh. Mm. Um, and to me begin to talk about both the naive, naivete of American culture of the time, but also the kind of wide-eyed uh, 
possibility that these young women have as they engage with people, the street. And on one hand, they're ignored and the other hand, they are purposeful and they move forward. And to me, the image that's on the left, which is slightly later, shows um, my, my mother's hesitation that this woman in some way is much more multi-dimensional. And you see often that she uses shadows here on the left-hand side of the woman who's looking directly into the camera sort of without fear is a image of a child, her child and her husband. And there's always this dynamic of a shadow of the other demands on a woman's lives. Whereas the images on the right-hand side are all about the possibility of youth. And I think as they got closer to the end of war, they become much more constrained as part of the return of the post-war uh, population coming in from Europe and the men returning and the conformist nature of that era. But mm -hmm. all the way through her career, she's interested in what happens outside of the frame and she's also interested in the moment before and the moment after the photographs taken. It's not a composition which is static. Like uh, if you look at her photographs, they're almost um, uniformly have soft focused or what's in focus might be the reflection rather than the woman itself. Right, and there's a variation to the degree of, of clarity. But I just was thinking, looking at these again, um, in as much as we've discussed your father's work in terms of um, a very sort of sophisticated um, understanding of the evolution of the visual culture through painting, et cetera. Um, your mother's adoption of many of these uh, more typical 40s um, uh, painterly styles uh, like soul lighter and just fragmenting and cropping in a more radical way an image to show its multi-dimensional uh not just subject but composition it was very uh it's very impressive for the I mean, it's also just extraordinary that vogue published these images like look yeah. at this woman with a handbag and her head is cut off and there's you know, a woman across the street, or there's a uh, an an older man with a cane. That there was a kind of grittiness to the images, as well as this and this, this contrast between I, naive youth and mm -hmm. age yeah. and infirmity. Or... Well, I think here the the image on the right is the image that it introduced um, my mother to Mason, my mother's work, and. To me, this is about who she was at the core. Mason's always sort of asked me, you know, what would she like as a parent? And on one hand, she was an extraordinary teacher and very generous, um, as were honestly many of her peers. But in, she also had a set of steeliness to her. And this image to me talks about the opportunity of a woman who's now engaged with a larger world. She's reading the newspaper. Her back is turned to us. She's definitely a woman of the world. She has a moxie, if you will, and an understanding. But my mother was also really aware of how people were excluded from opportunities. So she's reading the magazine, but she's standing in front of the newly built and opened UN, right. yeah. where those activities are happening, but she's excluded from them. So if you look at my mother's work, it's always about questioning a status quo and acknowledging that there are opportunities, but also lost opportunities for populations. Um, and in this case, particularly women who she advocated for. Yeah, I, I should remind you that I had maybe uh, 20 images that were sent to me uh, or we chose in a pool and and the graphic designer um, wanted a couple of images by Steichen and other people 
chimed in, but the moment I saw this photograph that just screamed modern, I just knew this had to be our, our cover and uh, sort of poster um, for the show. And um, I think it was so radical to have a woman with this sort of faux, you know, this Balenciaga or whatever, this back, I mean, just to invert the, the, the bodice, the, the lapel, the, and then have her facing away from the uh, gaze was really radical back then. And as you said, you know, the UN was, it didn't open for another year or two, but th this, a woman choosing how to be in the world, um, determining, making her own choices, whether to pursue a career or get married and have a family was, uh, particularly right after the war, was a, a very pressing uh, dilemma. And I think that this was a, a strongly proto-feminist work. And the sophistication that, um, that I, I saw in those other, the street scenes is carried through in this um, Vogue piece, uh, Carol Carls McCarlson, um, is sort of wondrously um, a bullient, daring um, view of women having fun and uh, being as elegant and, and, and or, you know, um, fearless and and presented in such a formally sophisticated constructivist manner with the beams, uh, et cetera, and the billowing uh, fabric behind. It's just a wonderful photograph, as, as is the one on the right, um, uh, as technically proficient and avant-garde, and yet conveying this idea of beauty mirrored um, in such an artist, or in a clever way. I mean, I, I also, I've, I've always loved these photographs where um, she was able to convey a woman comfortable in her own skin at rest, contemplative, enjoying life and enjoying the moment. And um, one of the people who was who work with both her and Irving Penn as an assistant used to say that my mother would go in and create a mood and that she gained the trust of the models very quickly. One, because she was female, but also because she was someone who was empathetic and could understand the dynamic of a place. And so she created and worked towards a scenic idea that she liked models who could act, who could participate, so yeah. that they were not staged, but that effectively they were given a theme or direction or an atmosphere or a narrative, and she allowed them to be players that responded and changed the dialogue of a set, if yeah. you would, or a the theatrical yeah. space. Or so in leading, these two cases, yeah. it's yeah. about it just pure enjoyment of who you are and the comfort of that moment. So we're now going into your sort of conversation of industry. And well, we've sort of covered it to a certain extent, but uh, I just think that, uh, you know, just your father was, um, was about as good as anyone, Irving Penn included. Um, uh, and he always had a twist, where, like the twist of lemon or the cork in the glass. I mean, he, he, there was a sense of humor, or even how Dannon wasn't, didn't. didn't they yeah, want to... I, I put these both in as a sort of <laughs> tongue in cheek because yeah. both of these were taken for clients. And then after, at least as my mother told, told it to me, after the official photo shoot was done, he would make a change. So on the left-hand side, what was a liquor, probably advertisement, he smashed the glass and left the shards down and retook it now as a personal photograph. And what Mason's referring to on the right was that this was a Dannon, early Dannon campaign. And he just burned the bottle around so that it became a personal photograph that he started to develop at this point. Were you searching for the brand? 
I think this comparison between Irving Penn and, and Leslie's, uh, Gill's work is instructive in that um, Penn has this whole narrative, you know, um, as the, uh, another famous work in our show after dinner games with the dice and uh, the cigarette smoke and the ashes and the food. Um, sort of leaving a trail of possible meanings of the narrative. But in, in, the, in Gill's work on the left, you really see how, again, it's not about um, a narrative as much as it is about this very, the artifice of a still life and how it can be made uh, in ways that become magical and uh, illustrative of some of itself, it's just more of a, it's a different kind of proposition that the artist is trying to convey. Would you agree? I do. I think also many, um, he, my father had a very wry sense of humor. So often there's hidden clues when you start looking. There's one I love that has a newspaper rolled up and there's this painting of a fisherman and you see the painting, the man is kind of highlighted. And then you read the newspaper and it says, you know, man killed or man murdered in hotel. You know, and so that there's always a tongue in cheek between right. text. Right. Or, I mean, I was looking at this one thinking, is there a relationship between fern, watermelon, and knife? Because sometimes the naming of things becomes a pun one way or another. Yeah. Well, sort of arriving at that, uh, the concluding uh, section of the show, which really um, here is uh, represented by a couple of works by Saul Leiter, who is known for his intimate black and white work um, that is so highly graphic um, and cropped and so contained in a poetic way. And yet in his larger color work, um, such as the red curtain in the middle, you see his, 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 how involved he was with the emerging uh, painterly uh, movement of Ab X uh, in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, he said to everyone downtown in the downtown scene, you know, you think you invented abstraction, but abstraction is all around you. Um, and it's how I just, you just have to be open to it. And this is one of the more really uh, subtle ways in which, which he uh, introduced detail with this kind of um, amazing complexity, I think, with the grill and the street and the drain and the manhole cover and the woman walking. Meanwhile, uh, there was few who dared to challenge status, the status quo of photography more than Robert Frank, who really believed um, that, uh, that the work could stand by itself. It didn't need a caption, it didn't need an explication. In fact, he, like many others of his generation, were schooled in graphic design. But, and he felt that the simplest image um, uh, could become the most sophisticated in terms of how it could be interpreted. So here, uh, Street Line, New York, 1951, he has a man approaching the line. Um, and, and of course, the narrative, narrative is, uh, that this was a juncture when that line that uh, defined what documentary photography was in terms of a transparent nar narrative would be crossed. And as he, he, he felt that the, uh, the very least, the onlooker had to have, had to do some of the work, had to interpret the work, him or herself. And, um, I think, uh, and, and confer onto um, uh, the image a certain autonomy. And, um, and I think that uh, it was because of his uh, study of graphic design early on that he sort of couldn't tolerate uh, 
having an editorial decision made. He couldn't, or some kind of brinkmanship with what was appropriate for a magazine or wasn't. So he, they started to really um, become less interested in even publishing their work, except as uh, books, monographs on the, their own work. As um, he almost, he actually made this book on the upper right, you see a spread um, that he would give to, and, uh, he, and he did give them to uh, a Brodovich, just to make Brodovich know that he knew as much as any art director, he knew his craft. And William Klein, who studied with uh, Leger uh, and was able to begin to photograph in a way that was all about a kind of graphic experience of the world and a whole new birth of visual culture that would explode in, in a few years uh, within the, uh, under the rubric of pop, pop art. And of course, there was Roy de Carava, who didn't want to seem or imbue his work with a certain kind of uh, underpinning of meaning or ideology. Here, he was just photographing um, musicians walking, and it was the subjective interpretation of the visual that just meant everything to him. They were like three notes on a uh, on a stave. And it was like conferring to photography, as Marshall McLuhan said, um, the last word, it was the medium itself. So the last thing that I was gonna say is just, you, we were supposed to be talking about Masons and my collab collaboration, but I think the journey that you've just seen through the exhibit is effectively how we, how we collaborate, right? And um, it, it struck me just at the end here is we really took on the spirit of the times that the show is. And so I can probably complete some of Mason's sentences and he can complete mine. And sometimes we bicker about where a photograph should be or shouldn't be. Uh, but I think what has been extraordinary is that for both of us, it's been this journey of discovery along the way, starting from his initial presentation of his ideas to my representation back to him of what I heard, uh, and then working through the nuances and discovery of work and people that I thought I knew well and now see in a new light to the introduction of my family and from two very different points of view, my father kind of bookending uh, and my mother as this person who is so of the moment because she really was in the advance of arguing for people that were overlooked or underestimated and to give them dimension and to show that in a public way. Make it visible, yeah. And so to me, the combination, the great joy of an exhibit as working as a designer is that you've given the gift of knowledge, but you also, honestly, Nathan and I will be friends for a lifetime. Yeah. And we've worked side by side now for almost two years, which two is years the duration that you started. Leslie, but it, it mirrors the, the beauty of, the, of collaboration that is expressed at this time Absolutely. in the art world. And uh, I thank you. Yeah, likewise. <laughs>